That's right. That's an achievement. Uh, and survived. That was a big achievement. Um, and then he, he was a student at the University of Rochester, MIT. Uh, he was also a professor at Clarkson University. He was chairman, chairman of the Department of Mathematics there, yeah? and Mathematics and Computer Science. Then he was dean of science at Clarkson. All that before he even came here. Uh, he was uh, also a Sloan Foundation Fellow and received the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship in 84. And he has many other honors, and one of them is being a highly cited author, according to the Web of Science. And as I said, he's also a professor of distinction here at the university. Um, Yes, uh, more journal papers than I, I can read. And <laughs> or I can read. Um, so today it's a pleasure to introduce Mark Alvarez. Well, thank you very much, Raphael. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It does look like a very good semester. I notice there's a difference between cozy students and advanced cozy students. What's an advanced cozy student? They were a student last year? No, no, they are in their Oh, and they're in their last year. Got it. Okay. So uh, I'm not an advanced cozy student. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, yes, I did grow up in, the, in New York, in fact, in the Bronx. I had a chat with Walter uh, Strauss on Friday, a visitor from uh, Brown, and he grew up in Brooklyn. No, Queens, Queens, where my aunt lived, and that was one of the highest level uh, mm -hmm boroughs in New York, other than Manhattan. What happened to me? I have to, I know I have to do something. There we go. Whoop. There we go. Okay, so I better move this thing. So today I'm going to talk about not only waves, I'm going to talk a little bit about fluid mechanics, or in fact a lot, water waves. Why am I going to talk about water waves? Well, I like water waves, number one. And number two, water waves has uh, suggested many ideas in optics. And in fact, today, I'll show you some things about water waves I haven't yet seen in optics. And, but you may say, oh, that's well known. Then you can tell us how to do these problems in water waves. Uh, waves, well, they're very uh, general. And they've held people's fascination for eons. Mathematically, it's a large field of research. And uh, the study of large amplitude waves uh, is also very, uh, has uh, received a lot of uh, attention, especially in the last 50 years. In terms of general interest, I have two figures here by the Japanese artist Hakusai. A fast cargo boat battling waves and the great wave off Kanagawa. The Great Wave is considered one of the most famous of Japanese prints. Uh, I rather like the fast cargo boat. This is it. And I like that big wave. 
sort of solitary wave. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about are localized waves today. So I like it for that reason also. You might say it's roguish. You know, because you got these little guys and this is an order of magnitude bigger. I don't quite know why it's fast, cargo boat, other than a lot of guys in the boat, maybe. We go to the great wave off of Kanagawa. This is a fierce looking wave. And there's foam at the top and spreading some, some little pellets of water, I guess. And there's Mount Fuji. And uh, there are these guys in the boat. Look like a lot of them. And maybe they're frightened. So here's what I'm going to talk about. History, mostly history of, uh, of uh, water waves. Localized waves, what we call solitons, and applications, water waves and optics. I'll concentrate on communications and lasers, Modlock lasers. I don't think I'll have time to talk about uh, photonic lattices, but we're working on that uh, in the special kinds of lattices, honeycomb lattices, which uh, come up in the study of gra graphene. So it's been given the name optical graphene in conclusion. So a uh, class of waves that have been of interest, especially to me, are localized waves. These are solitary waves in historical uh, language, and more recently called solitons. And if you go to uh, physicists, they know, they think they know what a soliton is. I'm not sure I know what they think it is. Um, but solitary waves appeared in water waves first. And they arise in uh, nonlinear equations. And frequently, uh, they're pretty hard to analyze. But sometimes we can get solutions and even the general, the general class of solutions. <clears throat> in physical problems, localized waves are seen, especially in optics. So today, probably, optics is the place where you see the word <coughs> soliton most frequently. And there are many fields, water waves, and coastal engineering, communications, lasers, photonic lattices, and many others, Bose-Einstein, biological dynamics, and just math problems. So in terms of water waves, the historical timeline is this. In the 1750s, this fellow, Euler, developed the uh, equations of frictionless fluids, and that's what Walter Strauss had to talk about on, on Friday, uh, water waves. Um, and he was, wrote many papers. He was blind for the last 20 years of his life. You can see in this portrait, he had a little problem with his right eye. Eventually, his left eye developed cataracts, I believe. So he was essentially blind, but still wrote many papers and uh, is well known in mathematics and physics. So he set out the fundamental equations. And in the early 1800s, the French Academy of Sciences announced a competition uh, for, uh, in water waves. And Cauchy won that competition. And he was awarded the prize. Strangely, what he did is he solved the initial value problem for water waves. The initial value problem, right? even that isn't so easy. And <coughs> even it would take, uh, of course, an introduction of PDEs to solve it. Uh, but he used work developed by Fourier. So he was well understand, he, he understood Fourier analysis to some extent. And that's why he got the prize. Strangely, Poisson was a judge on the committee and also submitted a paper. I never did understand that. And uh, it was eventually published in 1827. Somewhat controversial because most people didn't understand it. There's Fourier, uh, Cauchy, Poisson. And Cauchy is especially well known in complex variables. And probably motivated by water waves, since uh, classical water waves, you have naturally uh, coming out complex analysis with sort of it's underneath it, the uh, uh, Laplace equation. In 1830s, the British Association for the Advancement of Science set up a committee on waves. One of the, uh, the members was Russell. There's an early portrait of him. And he was interested in naval architecture. 
and they wrote three reports. The most important was the one in 1844, where he described an important discovery. I just paraphrase it here. He, dis he observed a localized, rounded, smooth, well-defined heap of water. He didn't talk about periodic waves, which he certainly saw, I mean, a periodic, something that resembles periodic. Uh, he talked about this localized wave. He called it the great wave of translation, but if you look at his work, he really was talking about it as a solitary wave. And the word solitary wave stuck. And he has this quote, such in the month of August 1834 was my first chance interview with that singular and beautiful phenomenon. He saw it while riding horseback next to a, a canal in Edinburgh. And he did experiments. And here are some experiments that came out of that paper. And here's this hump of water there. And you can see it here. And he had it traveling. He was measuring how s its speed and whatnot. And he even had uh, groups of waves that he was investigating, how they separated and depression waves, all of these play a role in understanding the phenomena. Uh, so he said, uh, now remain for the mathematician to predict the discovery after it happened. No problem there, that's most of what we do. You see it in the laboratory and we try hard to replicate it mathematically. And uh, unfortunately, a leading uh, fluid dynamicist said, no, this is not really a nonlinear phenomenon, which Russell said it was. It's linear. But in fact, Russell clearly showed that the wave moved at a speed proportional to the amplitude, which is not a linear effect. So uh, actually, history shows that he was not right on this area. Stokes came in 1840s. He worked with the nonlinear water wave equations. And Stokes found a periodic traveling wave called the Stokes wave. Many years later, it was shown to be unstable, interestingly enough, called modulational instability, Benjamin Fear instability. And op it's well known in optics also that similar kinds of waves are unstable because Stokes wave, when you modulate it, satisfies the same equation as the equations that come up in, in optics, not only the Schrodinger equation. There he is, Stokes. Doesn't look very happy in this uh, photograph. Uh, and he found for the nonlinear water wave equations, periodic wave, that the speed depended on the amplitude. Yet he didn't seem to come out for many years on the side of Russell. Um, and he made many other contributions, including setting out correctly what we now call the Navier-Stokes equations used uh, by, by uh, fluid dynamicists and mathematicians today. And there's a prize for being able to prove the existence of solutions, classical solutions to the equation. Well, you're, many of you are opticians, so you may say you'll believe the solution if you can produce it numerically. But mathematicians want to prove rigorously that there's a solution. And strangely, we work with these equations, but there's no rigorous proof yet that the solutions exist. <coughs> OK, we now go to the 1870s. And Boussinesque, that's him over here, found new equations by going to the water wave equations and making an approximation. Shallow water. In shallow water, things become easier. And he found solitary wave solutions. In 1895, uh, Korteweg here, he was a professor in Amsterdam and student, De Vries, found a right-going uh, wave equation probably within the context of Boussinesque. I don't read French that well, uh, but he wrote a very long paper, Boussinesque. And certainly some of what Kodeweg and de Vries said appears in his papers. Kodeweg and de Vries found periodic wave, and a special case is the solitary wave. So uh, in 1895, we'd say, OK, this were Russell's observations certainly confirmed. So 50 years later, science didn't move that fast then. And this is the equation. In a dimensional form, g is gravity, h is the undisturbed depth, 
T hat is a measure of surface tension, C is surface tension. And there's the equation here, and has uh, this uh, very simple looking nonlinear term, A to 8x, call it convective nonlinearity. There's eta, uh, the measure of elevation from non disturbed depth. If you uh, non dimensionalize it, is this equation. And it has this solution. And as I'll show you later, this solution is just a hump. And it moves the speed twice the amplitude. Exactly what, uh, when you unravel the dimensions, exactly what Russell found experimentally. And here is a beach. So I at least told you about beaches. And there is a more or less one dimensional wave. It's not weakly nonlinear as these equations are predicting. I'll talk about higher nonlinearity later. And there's a guy sitting on top of one of the bigger one, bigger portion of this moving along. But over here, it's not too big. If you look on the side, undoubtedly you see a sesh profile. Now, hmm, why doesn't this thing, oh, I know why, got it. Here we go. So if you learn nothing else in this lecture, here's the wave tank, and there's <clears throat> solitary wave. No wiggles to speak of. Very easily produced in the laboratory. Undoubtedly, what Russell saw. So KDV. Uh, 1895 to 1960, pretty much covered to 1895, but the different, the interregnum period wasn't uh, very notable. Uh, the equation was pretty much only known in water waves. That was where it was. It was third order equation, and mathematicians pretty much had spent most of their time analyzing rigorously second order equations. So there wasn't much uh, known. In the 60s, mathematicians developed approximate methods, approximation methods, multiple scale methods, very powerful multiple scale methods, or at least the beginnings of them, to find simplified equations. In particular, Cordelig de Vries and nonlinear Schrodinger equations not only come out of water waves, but shown to be universal. In 65, computation on KDV by Kreskel and Zabuski they introduced the term soliton. And I'll come back and tell you what that is. 67, a method of solution uh, to KDV, a general method for initial values that decay to infinity was presented. And uh, this was Gardner, Green, Kreskel, and Muir. Kreskel is here. Unfortunately, he's not with us any longer. So the 70s to present, KDV developments led to new methods in end results in math physics, uh, and researchers worldwide made important contributions. And there are many physically important systems, KDV, nonlinear Schrodinger, and the form that comes up in, in uh, water waves and uh, certain pl places in optics. Uh, and uh, the method is now called inverse scattering transform. And solitons are special solutions and we've written some papers and monographs on these subjects. One plus one dimension here, two plus one dimensions, and discrete here. And this method is well known. Now let me just give you the key concept. You take a nonlinear equation associated with a linear system. The Cordwick de Vries equation is associated with the time independent linear Schrodinger operator also another system. So uh, that's step one. The direct problem is you take initial conditions and you transform it into data, data for this linear system. So for the Schrodinger operator, you have what's called the reflection, transmission coefficients, and eigenvalues of the Schrodinger operator. You transform, you see how the, this data that's transformed evolves. The eigenvalues don't move for the Schrodinger operator and KDV. The inverse problem is to recover the solution from the evolved data. It's very similar to Fourier transforms. Fourier transforms, you take initial conditions, transform it to Fourier data, 
let the data evolve, do an inversion. The difference between Fourier analysis and inverse transform is inverse transform, you have integral equations. You have to study, the, you have to study linear integral equations. And even if you have courses in linear integral equations, I even had one, not many people have that anymore, uh, it's still a job to do it. So it's a more complex than Fourier transforms, but still you can get data, everything out. Okay. Here's, we're back to the solitary wave for Kordowicz degrees. This is an equation that the inverse transform method applies. And this is a special solution that the inverse transform comes out when you put this initial condition in at t equals zero, turns out the reflection coefficient of the Schrodinger operator is zero and has one eigenvalue and that eigenvalue of the Schrodinger operator is kappa. You evolve the problem and it turns out even though kappa remains constant, the sesh evolves this way. And this is exactly the solution of a one eigenvalue, one soliton solution. And this solution just moves uniformly. Okay, so, whoop, here we go. There you go, just moves. So when you transform it back to water waves, it's just that hump, no oscillations. When you take two special numbers, two eigenvalues, well, until this guy sees that guy, nothing much happens. They move independently, then they overlap, and the big one comes out, the little one is behind. The big one is pushed forward, the little one retarded. There's a phase shift, shift from where they would be if it were just the wave equation. Just the wave equation, they would add and go through. There is a nonlinear effect. That's why they call the solitons. The amplitude and speeds remain un, uh, unaffected after the interaction. And here's a two soliton solution. And that guy came out undisturbed. So that's the concept of solitons to a mathematician. But as I say, to physicists today, one localized wave is a soliton. They have subsumed the word soliton, and you can't fight that. It's, it's in the literature. So to this mathematician, I have to know, are you a mathematician? You're a mathematician. I know how to use the word soliton. If you're a physicist, I use it in a different way. Now I'm going to talk a bit about water waves, because uh, I have one little thing to say, well, a couple of things to say. So these are the equations from which Kordowicz de Vries equation came from. And this is uh, the domain. And what I have here the undisturbed depth is h, eta is the height, and this is the bottom. And it's written in terms of a velocity potential, a velocity potential is related to the velocity through the gradient. So uh, as Cauchy found, the internal part of the, mo of the fluid, this is the interior fluid, satisfies this linear equation, Laplace's equation. And the derivative phi y, that's the derivative going down. Uh, uh, there's no vertical derivative down because this is a flat bottom. And there are two conditions on the surface, called the kinematic condition and the pressure condition. Now, this problem is hard for two reasons. One, there's nonlinearity, there's products. And two, it's on y equal eta, and eta is the unknown in the problem. So it's a free surface problem, so we don't know how to deal with those very easily. And uh, a lot of what's done is to make h small. That's shallow water, when it's shallow, there's a good approximation. You can simplify this equation. I'll talk about that in a bit. What we did with my colleague Thanasis Fokas and postdoc at the time, Ziad Maslamani, is we converted that water wave system to these two equations. 
So now these two equations, one is non-local with a parameter k, free parameter. It's like a Fourier transform, but there's non-linearities, cosh and cinch. So there's non-linearities and an integral, and this is the pressure condition. This equation comes from Laplace and the boundary conditions, top and bottom. But it's on a fixed domain. So it has some attractiveness to it. And uh, we felt very good when we got it. And Thanasis, Focas has been pushing these non-local problems. He calls them global relations. And in some problems, they're very, very useful. And I think water waves is one of them. So we converted the water wave problem with this free surface to this problem, which is an integral differential equation and a PDE. Highly nonlinear, but fixed domain. And if you go to literature and water waves, you see that people do this all the time, trying to get fixed domains. OK. And k is a parameter. q is the velocity potential on the free surface. So two unknowns, eta and q. And here's another picture of this. q is the velocity potential on the free surface. And y is eta. Well, these variables, eta and q, we use by Zakharov in his Hamiltonian formulation. Craig and Sulem uh, derived a series in terms of these uh, functions, eta and q. And we can get that series from this operator, uh, from this integral equation. And um, I won't say anything more except the dirichlet norman map means how you go from Dirichlet conditions to Neumann conditions. And the problem is formulated for a Neumann condition. But what you get out of here is a connection between the Neumann uh, condition and the Dirichlet condition. So here's what we have found back in 06, and then with a student of mine, Terry Hout, more recently. We found conserved quantities, some new integral relations, all the well-known asymptotic reductions, at least the very well-known ones, KDV and not only Schrodinger, so it has shallow and deep water asymptotic reductions, and two plus one problems. In uh, water waves, a lot of people use complex variables when you have one space uh, in time, but here we have two space, so there's a little bit more you can do. So you can get two space one time. We also look with Terry at uh, interfacial flows and um, higher order expansions of 1D and 2D solitary waves. Well, well, here's an equation that comes out of that non-local system when you expand the cosh and the cinch to first order and take, a Fourier, take the Fourier transform. This is uh, an equation where you have Q as the unknown, and you have a Laplacian with a deformation gamma, and Laplacian squared, so it's a biharmonic-like operator, and quadratic nonlinearity. When these small parameters in this non-dimensionalization, epsilon is a measure of the amplitude, mu is long waves when it's small, gamma is small transverse dimension. So this equation, when you take what we call maximal balance, all these guys related, epsilon, mu, and gamma, then you get this equation. This has got a name called the gadamsev pefiashvili equation. And you see this is KDV, so it has an extra two y derivatives. So this comes out of that non-local theory. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I know of this KP equation. When sigma hat is positive, sigma is the surface tension, is greater than a third, then you have one sign called KP1. You get one class of solutions, sigma is less then zero, sigma hat, near, sigma near zero, you get kp2. Sigma in, in oceans is close to zero. Here's a solution of kp1 with strong surface tension. Actually, in this normalization, I reverse the sign. It's a depressive uh, guy, and here's the solution. This is an exact solution of that problem. It moves with this speed in x, this speed in y, so it always moves Here's x, this direction. So always moves positively in x. And uh, it can move anywhere in y. And these parameters relate to the eigenvalue underlying the theory. 
And it turns out that these uh, lumps are very good approximations to Benny Luke. So Benny Luke is not integrable, but K KP is integrable. It's one of those integrable, one of those inverse transforms uh, equations. It's part of why we can get this. Another thing we can do is go to uh, find expansions for the wave height in powers of hyperbolic secant. So if we expand those Cosh and Cinch operators to high order, we can write out, if you will, a high order KDV uh, approximation. And we can find, here's two terms, sash squared, epsilon is small amplitude, quote unquote small, sash squared, sash to the fourth, epsilon squared, and uh, Terry continued it to 14 terms with Mathematica. And uh, alpha is related to epsilon by fixing at the origin if sigma smaller than third one or minus one if it's greater than third. So eta depends on sigma and epsilon. And here are some plots we found. When sigma is less than a third, we plot energy versus amplitude. It goes up and has a little turning point, about 0 0.8. 0 0.8, roughly, is where the maximally energetic wave is. And why we went through this is the following. When sigma is zero, as I said, people use complex variables. So they found this series about 30 years ago, long at Higgins when uh, sigma was zero. So we said, well, since we had sigma in our theory, we should not only be able to replicate this, but also give you the structure of what happens with surface tension. So that's why we did it anyway. So it has this turning point, and up to here, Tanaka proves that this is stable, and right beyond that, there's what's called a stagnation point. Walter Strauss talked about such things, it's when the velocity uh, of the wave equals uh, the phase velocity of the wave, or in the moving coordinate, you stagnate, stagnate. And right here is what's called the wave of maximum height. This was found or conjectured by uh, Stokes in 1880s. You have a wave, and it goes to a 120 degree corner. And we get very close to that 120 degree corner without surface tension. With surface tension, we don't see corners at all. And here you can see the wave maximal, maximally energetic wave. So we did that up to 0.3, roughly 0.3, and the energy decreases as uh, you look at the maximally energetic wave. Tanaka proved the wave is stable up to here and unstable beyond that. I assume it's stable up to here in the same way has not been proven yet. And here's the amplitude versus sigma, it goes down. And also we compared with some recent experiments and now water waves, there is surface tension. And just at the maximal amplitude of that wave, that big solid wave, they push it up right as you get to the top is little ripples of surface tension type. So it looks like surface tension is having an effect right near the top. And right at the maximally energetic one, a little stable one, agreed with what we found, which was somewhere between zero, sigma zero and 0 0.5. Now, when you have sigma greater than a third, that's very high surface tension. And only very recently, people did experiments in high surface tension. And these are depressive waves, and about five years ago or so, did these experiments. But we also get waves, energy, energy versus sigma, and up to about two, there's a turnover, but from two on, the energy is more or less monotonic. And this is a figure of the maximum amplitude versus sigma. It gets almost to the top, to the bottom meaning we can find waves which apparently will be stable right down to very close to the bottom. 0.98, 1 is the, epsilon equals 1 is the bottom. So 
Epsilon formally was small, but when you add up a lot of terms, there's enough convergence to give you a realistic approximation. We can also do this in 2D because this non-local uh, equation is valid not only in 1 but 2D, and we can get at least three terms. The difference between one dimension and two dimensions is in one dimension we can go high order because analytically we can solve for all these guys beyond the first. In uh, 2D we only have A to naught and Q1, Q naught analytically, so it becomes a large numerical operation. Now I'm going to tell you another thing about KP. So what I talked about before was one-dimensional solitary waves. Now I'm going to talk about two-dimensional solitary waves. Here's KP with, very, with zero surface tension. Well, I say there's a class of solutions, which you can check. You can go back right after this and take F1 to be e to the a to 1, where a to 1 is given here. K1 and P1 are constants. And F2 with this term e to the a12, and plug it in, you'll convince yourself these are solutions. I'm only going to look at these two. When you have this one, it's exactly a KDV type solution just rotated. And if you look from above, it's just a wave moving in 2D uh, trans in some oblique angle. But what about these guys? Well, here's a case, and Douglas is here. He helped me plot these. And he knows how interested I am in this. This has occupied a lot of my brain cells. There aren't that many left. But I find this very fascinating stuff. Here's the interaction. This is uh, an X-type interaction. This is just this solution. Sum of exponentials, put it in, take two derivatives. Nothing more. And when e to the a12, this term here, is order 1, this is more or less what you get. We call it an x wave with short stem. If e to the a12 gets small, that stem gets longer. I'm going to tell you, this comes out more ways. I haven't seen this in optics. So you can tell me after this lecture, you're wrong, this appears in optics. And then I'm going to, tell, I'm going to ask you, well, then you can help us compute kp directly. And here's e to the a12 going to 0. That stem gets much longer. Okay. Now, you see that thing? That is a figure in the book I wrote with Harvey Seeger. And we got this from a photograph. Uh, actually, Pat uh, Weidman sent it to us. And uh, we asked the ph photographer for if we could reproduce it, and he allowed us to do so. It's like an X-wave, long stem, I call it. So I thought this you know, occurs once every 50 years. Fact, occurs every day. You just need to be near a beach. Now, that doesn't help us here. You've got to get on a plane to see a beach or drive a long distance. Here's a picture of an X-wave. This is shallow water, and every day, low tide comes in. And you see you get a very shallow regime. And this is where KP applies. And there's a little hump. I call that a short stem. Here's another short stem. I, I see them all the time. I took these pictures. And I saw one just very recently. It's, it was just great. I just didn't have uh, the camera with me. And they come quickly because they're not stationary. Here's some guy walking on this long, flat beach. It's about four or five inches depth. Here's a long stem interaction. There's another interaction there. And here's a Y. We call this a Y junction. These guys are the most common. I see Y junctions most of the time You know, if you, in this regime. X, I have to look pretty carefully. Then there's a whole theory on more interactions uh, where you have many in and many out, n in, m out. And uh, people are studying this uh, mathematically, notably Yuji Kodama and um, Sharvi Chakravarti at Colorado Springs, and uh, Gino Biondini, who was a postdoc here. And 
we also derived, uh, with Terry Howe, interfacial waves and, and the non-local theory. But I'm not going to go through it because you're probably saying, OK, I've heard enough water waves. After all, there's a cozy seminar, and you have all these cozy people. And cozy is supposed to see some optics. So uh, in the next 15 minutes, I'll talk a little bit about optics. Fiber optic communications and modal optic lasers. I don't think I'll have much time to talk about lattices, but I may have a word. Uh, and here, nonlinear Schrodinger equations play a big role. So in optics, uh, in the 70s, researchers found from Maxwell's equations with suitable uh, polarization terms, nonlinear Schrodinger equation comes out using method of multiple scales. And Hasegawa and Tappet suggested solitons for communications. Experiments were carried out by Molinauer and many others. And indeed, they saw solitary waves in optics or solitons, no question. Uh, they thought maybe it would be useful in communications, but they were looking at what we call single channel. When you take a fiber and send waves in different frequencies, red, green, blue, there's some interactions. And this causes problems, so they needed the concept of dispersion management. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. And dispersion management is commercialized. And we developed some math methods to analyze these things. And in terms of math, the equation in normalized terms is this. U is related to the electromagnetic field. Z is the propagation distance uh, down the fiber. Uh, T is retarded time. D is related to dispersion and uh, damping and amplification. It's a nonlinear coefficient. So this is an equation that with some work you can derive with approximations from Maxwell's equations. And dispersion management means you don't have just a constant here. You have a term which is large and rapidly varying. That was the trick. And it changes sign. One time delta is positive, another uh, section it's negative. And that has a big effect on these, uh, on these interactions. And N has some damping amplification factor. You can take it to be just one. Average of delta is zero. So this is a period, large and periodic. In typical numbers, ZA is small, about 0.1. Pulse width, 10 picoseconds. And here's a schematic. You have, you're here. You call your friend in, we used to say Japan, but now we'll say China. You call your friend in China. And it goes through these fibers. In single channel communications, they have just one fiber constant. They need these amplifiers because there's significant damping. So there's amplification, damping, and then amplification. And between two amplifiers, you have two pieces of fiber, roughly. One with one sign, another with another. And that takes care of these significant penalties. And so it's used not in nonlinear problems, but for more linear problems. I tell people, actually, I don't care if you use solitary waves. You know, people think I'm attached to solitary waves. I'm much more attached to the nonlinear equation. The nonlinear equation is the mathematician's job. If you go to Maxwell's equations, try to compute Maxwell's equations over 10,000 kilometers, you'll never get an answer. So you need these kinds of approximate equations, and they come out of multiple scale methods. Thank you, the mathematicians. And so we de derived an asymptotic method of multiple scales to handle dispersion managed systems where you have a fast and a slow scale. You go through this method. At leading order, you have an unknown amplitude times exponential of a phase. And this unknown amplitude is determined at next order through what we call secularity conditions. And at the end of the day, the amplitude satisfies an integral differential equation. This is an integral over the fast scale. So only slow scales apply. If you convert this integral, this is the average integral 0 to 1 of d zeta. And period is 1 in this normalization. You have a double convolution. If r is constant, it's just the nonlinear Schrodinger equation for a domain. 
R is related to uh, the nonlinearity in the phase C. If you look for special solution, some function of omega times of e to the i constant z, then you get a fixed point integral equation, which we derived years ago uh, with, Mus uh, with uh, Gino uh, Biandini. And this nonlinear equation, we developed numerical methods to solve. Only time we can solve analytically is when r is a constant. Then we get the Fourier transform of Sesh. It's an exact solution. Otherwise, we use numerics. Uh, and we've sort of refined that over the years. And these, th this equation has solutions. It's been proven to exist. And also proven that the dispersion managed theory is a, uh, uh, a uh, adequate approximation over long time, uh, meaning it is an asymptotic approximation rigorously. Here's a classical soliton, here's a DM soliton. So that's communications. I really stopped working communications after a telephone call from a colleague here in Gila and physics, Steve Cundiff. Steve said, we got these Modlock lasers here, and we're studying them. And uh, he asked me some questions, of which I knew no answers. But they all sounded interesting. And at the end of the day, he had this tabletop experiment about this big. And you had a laser in there, and uh, this is, or crystal actually. You pump laser sent in a signal, goes through this crystal, goes through a mirror, through a prism pair. You could see everything right on the tabletop. Goes back, and it expunged some energy, and some analysis showed there were pulses coming out. And the upshot is that people at NIST are very interested in these systems because they are uh, what they call optical clocks. You get pulses, and these pulses are like ticks on a clock. And uh, they're about 10 femtoseconds, three orders of magnitude smaller than communications in terms of the time scale. And you heard uh, Henry Captain, he's two orders smaller with X-ray lasers. But I'm not there. I'm right here uh, with this system. And uh, the important remark about dispersion managed systems is tie sapphire crystals have one sign of dispersion, and the prism pair counteracts that. This is negative dispersion. We call it normal regime. This is the positive regime. And they found, before I were talking to us, and talking to people in communications, that that's what they needed. They needed a dispersion managed system in order to stabilize and get their pulse uh, train, which they can then work with. And the question that uh, he asked is, well, a number of things. I won't go all the details, but are these pulses solitons? And the answer is yes. And um, the system we began working with, with Steve, was exactly the uh, dispersion mass system of communications. This was zero. Subsequently, we added some more terms. So originally, we had no extra terms. When you have these extra terms, this is a gain term saturated by energy, filter term saturated by energy, and a power term, uh, I mean a loss term, saturated by power. So that's the system we, we work with. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit why. This, we call this the power energy saturation model. And without these terms, you don't get mode locking. That's the reason for these terms. So we uh, worked with Steve and his student, Kutsu Karashi. And uh, this is how the dispersion managed theory compared to experiments. Here's uh, some values of average dispersion. Black is one average dispersion blue another, uh, green another, and this is what they call the anomalous regime. So here's the theory, and here's the theory. These are theory numbers based on uh, these average dispersions and power regime that we're in. And um, well, it's not too bad. And this is only a first approximation. So we uh, concluded that 
And there's one fitting parameter, one, just here. There's one fitting parameter, everything else fit. So pulses, our conclusion was well approximated by dispersion matter solitons. But we couldn't at that time describe why we locked into these modes. What they did, they have this laser and then they tapped it. And after they tapped it, the laser found a mode locked pulse state. So we went back with Theodore Harikas and uh, Sean talked about this, Sean Nixon. He's an advanced COSY student. Right there. Last year you talked. You were in advanced last year. Or was it this year? When did you talk? Last year. Last year. So he wasn't advanced. He was a baby COSY student. Now he's advanced. At any rate, we worked with this. And um, now, why did we come up with this system? Well, actually, this was around, uh, studied by House uh, in between the 70s and 90s. And the difference between what House was looking at after many papers was he took the loss term and expanded it nonlinearly. So this loss term took the power and expanded it in Taylor series and just took the first nonlinear term. Unfortunately, as people found, it does not give you mode locking in a wide range. But when you change to the saturated term, things change nicely. And you do get mode locking. And more recently, in 2009, Cartner's group numerically compared very similar models to this, more exotic functions of D and N and whatnot, to uh, his uh, Thai Sapphire laser system and found fairly good results. Mathematicians like to boil things down to the simplest uh, possible model. Here's one picture of what happens. You take an initial Gaussian, it wiggles around for a while. For, this is some G, I don't remember, maybe 0.3. It wiggles around the mode locks. And for various Gs, you get mode locking gains. And um, then we uh, did some more uh, work and found if you took a wide initial condition, you broke into two. Let me, yeah, you could break into two strings of solitons. This is also observed in the laboratory. Uh, then we said, well, suppose you go to this equation here and just look for solitary waves. We had convenient numerical methods. We used them and they agreed with these mode lock states. What I'm saying here is that when it mode lock for constant dispersion, the difference between the mode lock state in the, in the PES system and the system without gain and loss was negligible. But you see this parameter mu is picked out by PES. It's not picked out by NLS. If you go to the NLS problem or DMLS, uh, and you look for this ansatz, mu can be in a semi-infinite bed. But it's picked out with these extra terms. Well, I'm not going to say much more. I'm going to summarize, because I think you've been very patient, and very nice, and I could continue easily for another 40 minutes, and that would be harsh. Now, in Japan, in the old days, that's what they did. I don't know if it's anymore. But they go into seminars, and you lace your boots up, because it started at 3, maybe ended at 12. I don't know. In Russia, I think they had similar kind of thing in the famous seminars like Yelfen. He started at 8, and it would end at midnight or something. OK, but that's not here. We're in cozy land. I'm going to finish on time. So what we find, mode locking occurs for a wide range of parameters in constant dispersion and dispersion managed systems. We find localized modes separately, and they are they agree with the mode lock states of the general system. <clears throat> and when they mode lock, they mode lock into a case where the gain loss in the anomalous regime is small. We also find mode locks, we also find mode locking in the normal regime, but the normal regime you have a phase chirp. We find strings of solitons, anti-symmetric bisolitons, all these things in one form or another have been observed. And we've written a paper on uh, 
describing all these things, not just numerically, but analytically through uh, uh, method of multiple scales. And if that interests you, you can see our papers 08 and 10. I'll have one word. We're now studying waveguides and lattices, and we're studying uh, solitary wave solitons and their cousins, not only for lattices, which are corrugated structures like this, but, and here periodic, but also honeycomb lattices. And these honeycomb lattices, this means you have a honeycomb hexagonal structure, you send a wave down the uh, periodic lattice of hexagonal shape. And there's a lot of interesting features about this as compared to rectangular lattices. And uh, Yi Zhu, my postdoc, has worked very hard with, with me on this. And uh, we're still working very hard. It's very interesting. There's some recent experiments uh, from Segev's group on it. All this math is going away. Oh, here's a nice picture of a honeycomb lattice. This is a particular uh, figure, and it has this nice star of David hexagonal structure. He's a min, 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 min. He's a max. That's typical of what you see. I'm just moving through to the conclusion. Sorry about that. That's the 40 minutes you didn't have to stay. So I talked uh, about uh, nonlinear waves and water and optics, water waves, uh, long history, and we reformulated it. Uh, more recently is a non-local spectral system. And we find asymptotic reductions, Benny Lu, KP, Melanie Schrodinger, KDV is below KP. We found, uh, I discussed high order series to describe large amplitude gravity capillary waves in 1 and 2D. In optics, uh, Melanie Schrodinger systems are quite prevalent. And I talked a little bit about communications and lasers. And lasers, these mode locking models and uh, uh, these lasers, these Modlock lasers, are of extreme interest to people over here in physics and GILA. And then photonic lattices, I just didn't have time to really go through, except to say we're very interested in uh, background, hu background honeycomb lattices because of their novel, inter interesting structure. And these also come up in physics, notably the whole uh, study of graphene. Thank you very much for your attention. Did I finish in time? <laughs> Finished in time. We we'll have time for a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, I have a question about water waves, actually. Yeah. Have, have you ever observed a lump source in the ring? Not observed yet. 1D, they observe depressive waves. Lumps would be observed if you could get sigma to be big enough. They're able to do that for 1D because 1D, they use mercury. 1D wave tank isn't too big. The problem with 2D, I think, is that it's very big. Too big, too heavy. But I think they will see it. Does any of this have uh, any application to the rogue waves? To rogue waves? Yeah, yeah. Um, if you ask my opinion, the lumps, no, because that sigma is two thirds, and and water waves, real water waves, sigma is like 0.02 or so. But these other guys, these X waves, some people believe, you know, if you manipulate around uh, that these uh, phase terms, you can get guys that bubble up factor of three or four or five. Basically, my opinion is right now, we don't ne necessarily really understand all the causes of rogue waves. Uh, there is this very interesting theory of uh, optical rogue waves. We, we had a lecture uh, recently um, by a fellow named Dudley. And there, in optical rogue waves, I think they can reproduce things easily. Water waves, you know, you have these ships, they go on along, and then all of a sudden, once in a while, some giant either positive or negative wave, remember, we're talking elevation, it could be a depressive wave, crunch. And Banked has done work on this, of water waves, and he may say 
his theory is it. I don't know, I haven't heard him say that, but it's still a, a field of, of interest. That subject is that the, there are some satellites up there that monitor the world's ocean continuously in ultra low waves. And the estimate is that at any instant there are approximately 12 active somewhere on the ocean, but oceans are so big, so they are still encountered very little. But the, that was, the, I think, the current estimate. And so you better be, not be near one of those 12 places. But are some more prevalent than others near big currents like off of South Africa? Yeah. Yes, Kelvin. Um, so there's two types of these high sapphire lasers. There's the linear capacity and the rings. And the rings are interesting because they laze either in one direction or the other. So there's clearly a competition. So are your equations the uh, solitary waves in the mathematical sense or in the physical sense? In other words, can these two waves crash through each other and coexist or do they not? Okay, so uh, my statement is that these are solitary waves in the mathematical sense because they need dispersion management. One of the things we asked when we studied dispersion managed theory was whether they were solitons in the mathematical sense. And I think we convinced ourselves for a variety of reasons it was not, uh, not given the uh, physics of these problems. So they are solitary waves. But in the application in communications, they put them, uh, rather, they separate them quite a bit in frequency space. When they separate them in frequency space in our language, they go through each other rather fast, and there's very little interaction. So in the application they're interested in, in communications, they are uh, sol solitary waves. Any real mathematical investigation, we, can, we would conclude these are solitary waves and not solitons. I'm glad you asked it in that way because now I could talk to you as though you are a mathematician. Okay, that's, thanks. That's